stuff that's going on right now in the news, things that are going on in our world, things that are going on around us. Uh, if you're watching the news or you're paying attention at all to what's happening in our nation, you can, there's some some things going on that really bothered me this week. Uh, it bothered Jane and I both pretty intensely. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. but Let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we begin here. Father God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us another day to come and worship you in your house. Lord, I thank you that we have the, the ability and the right to come together and worship you freely and openly, Lord. I just pray that you give me the words that you want spoken, Father, and that you, uh, you open our hearts and our ears to what's going on around us and what you want us to do about it. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how many of you are aware of all the things that are going on. There's so much news. There's so many things going on right now. There's so much arguing. and The government shutdown's over, and everybody's pointing fingers and blame and claiming credit and all sorts of things going on like that. And in the midst of all those things, some other stuff's happening. It's not getting a whole lot of news. It's not getting a lot of stuff right up front. One of the things that happened this week is the state of New York signed a bill into law saying that it was legal to do abortions up until the point of birth. Nine months right up to the point of birth. And that was something that was decided on, voted on, and signed by their governor. And they're the first state in the country to do that. Jane brought this up, so I actually looked it up. And that's a picture of the governor of New York signing that that bill. And what bothered her, and what bothered me the most when I saw it was the laughter on their faces. That that hit me really, really hard. Because they thought that was funny. Amen. Because what they're saying is that right up until a couple moments before this happens, it's okay that that baby not live. And it, the qualification is if it's going to cause physical or emotional challenges or damage to the mother. That choice can be made as long as it's going to cause emotional damage, which means it opens it up to anything they want to say, anything they want to do. Um, and that bothers me deeply. And that's not the only thing going on in our country that bothers me. I'm very proud to be an American. I'm very proud that I live in this country. I'm grateful to God for all that we've been provided. But as I see things like this happening, and see things like the, the fighting and the arguing, and quite frankly, the hypocrisy of someone who's really concerned about these poor kids trying to come across the border, which I have compassion for also, but that same person would vote that this baby shouldn't live. That I went through a bunch of stages. My first, my first reaction, of course, was anger. I was angry that this would happen. At the same time, there's other states doing just the opposite. Ohio's governor says he's going to sign the bill when it comes to a, his death, saying that a baby is a baby at heartbeat. So it's going to be just the opposite. They don't back it up. As soon as you can hear a heartbeat, that's it. You can't have an abortion once we can hear a heartbeat. Amen. South Carolina is doing things similar to that. There's some other, other states that are talking just kind of the opposite, but it bothers me that our most populous state and our most populous city can crank out stuff like this. <laughs> But it shouldn't surprise me much, I guess. Second Timothy. Paul talks about this. And I think this is something we need to keep in mind. This, all, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Just think about that. Is that not a description of what we see daily in our own country? Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away from with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning, but never getting to the truth. He continues on in uh, 13 through 17. 2 Timothy 3, 13 through 17. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
but continue thou in things that thou hast learned, <coughs> and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, and for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished unto all good works. Paul's talking to Timothy about how the world is going to go down, how it's sliding downhill, and he talked about it then, and it's happening now. I don't think we can see these things that are happening in our world right now and see anything other than the end rushing towards us. We know things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse and worse, as he says here. Evil men and seducers shall work worse and worse. When I look at that picture, my first thought was that was incarnate evil. People signing a bill like that and smiling about it, that was evil on the earth. And then I thought about it and I thought, you know what? There was a bunch of people that sat down and got a chance to vote on that, and the majority of them said that was okay. And then there are other people within that state that could have said something about it and apparently didn't. And whether it was from inaction or from action, chose that that happened. I pray for those people. Because that activity, they were they were happy to sign this on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, by the way, which slipped by us and we did, I, and I didn't even didn't click in my head till I saw it. But that is incarnate evil, I believe. And coming from our country, who is supposed to be a light into the world, that bothers me a lot. It may be happening somewhere else but I can distance it a little bit there. I can't distance it when it's in my own country. My wife and I got married in upstate New York because she was stationed there. I never lived in New York. She did in upstate New York. It's a whole other world than New York City, but even that contest of being that close to it, it bothers me. But Peter had, had uh, addressed this. In First Peter, we're going to talk about what we're supposed to be doing because this is happening. Not just that it's happening, but what should we do? So, 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 7 says, The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. In these times, more than ever, we need to be praying. And he says, be alert and of sober mind. Be sober minded, self-controlled, ready to go. So what do we pray for? How do we pray? Well, I think the first thing we need to pray for is that God opens people's eyes. We need to see these things going on around us. It's very, very easy for us to be like the frog in the proverbial pot. They say if you put a frog in a pot of, of lukewarm water, put it on the stove and turn it up, he'll never notice it's hot until he, gets, until he dies. It'll just slowly heat up around him and he won't even jump out of the pot. If you put him in hot water, of course, he'll jump out of there. But that slow slide that's happening that's right. is so easy for people to just kind of let it go and just kind of let it slide. Unless we open our eyes, we can't see the need and we can't see the problem. So God has to open people's eyes. The next thing we need to pray about is we need to pray that God protects the innocent. So many times we pray and we see miracles happen. And there are a lot of times when we pray and we don't see the miracle happening, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Jane told me a story yesterday about when she was in uh, photojournalist school and they had to go out and get photos of something that was news, political, something going on. So she, out of uniform, took her camera and went down to a Planned Parenthood clinic where there was a protest outside. And she's walking down the street, a young woman walking down the street. And this very kindly, grandfatherly-looking gentleman comes up and asks her if he can escort her to the clinic. That was his job. To walk young ladies into the clinic past the protesters and stuff. And I'm sure he thought he was doing a good thing. I'm sure he thought that he was providing a service for someone in need. But when she's telling me that story, when she said that, it shocked me when she said what he was actually doing. 
And I think God is God, and He is at work. Our God is alive, and He is active right now. And I think our prayers make a difference. And I think praying for things that we may never see happening is something that we should be doing. I don't need to know whether or not my prayers are being answered. I know they're being heard. And God takes care of the rest. So I think praying for this is something that's necessary. In addition, we should be praying that God comes soon. You want to end human suffering? That's the answer. We know that is the end. We need to be praying that, that His majesty will be revealed and He will come soon and this will be over. And that's not something that I, I do lightly. Because I realize with concept that God laid out before us of heaven and hell, that means hell is coming too. For some people on this, on this earth right now, hell is coming at them, rushing at them face first. And when God comes and that final judgment is there, you can't change your mind anymore. And I know that's going to happen. And that bothers me enough that I have thought in the past I shouldn't be praying that God comes soon. But in the meantime, what's going to happen? How much suffering is going to happen? How much are we going to bring upon ourselves until he does come back? Another thing I think we should be praying for is that God uses us to the utmost in these times, in this end time, in this time when things are getting worse, we should be working harder. We each have the ability God gave us to do certain things, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute because Peter talks about that, but I think we should be praying that God uses us to fulfill as much of our potential as we can possibly fulfill, to use us the, as, as, as much as he can. Another thing I think we should be praying for is that God gives us power. I pray that God gives me power to witness. And we know that he fills us and he speaks through us and it's not us, it's him. But fill me with that power right now. More so than ever before, God's word needs to be heard. And we are his hands. That's what we're meant to be doing, right? And the last one I, I, I put on here is that God, just give me a chance to make a difference. Pray that God gives us that, that chance to make a difference. We all make a difference in some ways in our lives every day. There's, there's, we have impact every single day. But there are times when it intensifies and we get that opportunity, that one little piece. At the men's Bible study, we talked about... Um, making a difference in some of those things and, and we talked about the talents one of the things we're supposed to be doing is is keeping a journal between now and the next uh time we get together about the things that make you feel strong and the things that make you feel weak the instances the little times in <clears throat> in life where you felt stronger i had one of those times friday friday afternoon seventh hour i've got a study hall full of seventh and eighth graders which is always a wonderful way to end the day because they're always just wound up as all get out. And I had a girl from the high school come in and, and come to me and say, what's going to happen if I just walk out of school right now? And I said, what's the matter? And she said, well, mentally I'm having a really, really hard time right now. Mm. And she was supposed to be in somebody else's study hall. And I said, well, you can't just walk out of school. I said, you can call, some, call your parents mm. and they'll check you out. She said, I can't go. There's different things going on right now. I just can't get a hold of So we sat for that entire hour. And I we talked about different things. We talked about her future. We talked about the things she wants to do. I went onto my computer. I said, let's look at, she wants to go to a pre-vet program. And I said, well, let's look at where they are in South Dakota. What's going to take to get there? And the bell rang. And I didn't pay attention to the time, but the time finished and she didn't leave school. And afterwards, I was praying. I, I thank God so much for the opportunity to be there and that she came to me and she said, what should I do? Amen. My first thought was, well, why don't you go ahead and talk with the principal? He'll understand. And she has a pretty good relationship with him, but he was in there with parents of a child who was having other issues and was busy. So God opened that door and allowed me to do that. And at the time, I didn't think that that was necessarily from God, but afterwards I thought about it and I thought, oh, thank you. That you gave me that opportunity. Praying for those opportunities, praying for that chance, praying for those things are something we need to be doing. 
We cannot ignore things. We can't ignore what's going on. We have to be doing something. Nothing is in the world is beyond God's control, but nothing is also beyond our sphere of influence. Right. There's nothing beyond prayer. There's nothing beyond what we can put our hands on that we can do. Nothing is more powerful for Satan than to make you feel worthless or impotent or unable to do something. He'd love it if you sat back and said, I don't think I can do anything. Satan would love that. God says, that's not what God says we're supposed to be doing. And Peter says, we should be praying. We should be praying with a sober mind, a clear mind, self-controlled, and full of the knowledge of God's word. When we see these things happening, that should, that should motivate us to be more active and not less. We shouldn't be overwhelmed by that. We should be encouraged. We should be motivated to get into the fight, not afraid of the battle. Now, the second thing Peter talks about in this, in, in 1 Peter here, 1 Peter 4, 8, the next verse, he says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Love each other deeply, wholeheartedly, completely. We should be loving each other. That should be our, our, our <laughs> motto. That should be what, what we stand for. More than anything else, we should be standing for love. Paul talks about this in Ephesians, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul saying, I want you to be so full of love it's overflowing. And all you have to do to do that is have the knowledge of God within you. If you have the knowledge of God, if you know, if you know through faith, if you know these things, that you are rooted in faith and you are rooted in love, that God's power will come and you will know that. This love surpasses knowledge. It goes beyond man's thoughts. It goes beyond people's reason. The love of God goes beyond it. It's bigger. It's bigger than anything that's going on. That love is important. Love forgives 70 times 7. Jesus talked about how important love was. In 1 Corinthians, Paul also talks about a mature love. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they cease. Where there are tongues, they'll be still. Where there's knowledge, it'll pass away. For, for we know in part, and we prophesy in, prophesy in part, that when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put, away, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection in the mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Folks, I cannot stress this one enough. He talks, what Paul's talking about here is all the other little things in life. All the little things about our faith are just a shadow of the reality of when we stand face to face with God. We have pieces and parts. We're looking at a mirror. We're not looking at we're not looking completely. We don't see it all yet. And everything else fades away. There's only three things left, and that is faith, hope, and love. And that has to be our maturity. That's where we put away the childish things and hold on to the stuff that cannot be destroyed. Faith, hope, love. That is, the, that is the principles of what we believe, and that needs to be what we stand on, not in a childish way, but in a mature way. We need to be able to grab a hold of that and hold on to that and make that who we are. Without that love, we are not followers of Christ. Without that love, we are not fulfilling the mission that God intended for us. 
Now that doesn't mean that there is not righteous anger in love. That does not mean that there is not discernment in love. That doesn't mean that we should not be, be opposed to things that are happening. But it means that we do that in love. That's the way Jesus lived, isn't it? Isn't, wasn't he the ultimate example of that? There was times when Jesus was very, very angry. More than once. There were times when Jesus was upset with his own followers. Oh, this generation. When are you going to grow up? When are you going to learn? Faith. Hope. Love. Grab a hold of that. You won't need all these other things. Don't worry about all the small things. Hold on to the big ones. The next thing Peter talks about in 1 Peter 4 is giving. He says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. No time, like the present, to put ourselves into a giving mode. Not a fearful mode where we're, we're trying to hold things back, but we need to be giving. And it says, give without grumbling. I think we honestly need to give like there's no tomorrow. Because there probably won't be. We look at the end of the world, we look at the end of time, we look at the time before Jesus comes, what do you want to be holding on to when he gets here? What do we what 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 can't you do without when you're standing in front of Jesus? Everything else is going to be gone. Don't be afraid to give. Don't be afraid to let it go. <coughs> we need to be given like we're receiving. Our giving should be receiving. We should be giving as if it's our if we're receiving something when we give it away. That's why people buy lottery tickets. They're happy to hand somebody money thinking maybe more money will come back. Can't we have the faith of a lottery ticket to give to God? Knowing that he's going to do something better with it than, than we were doing with it anyway? We should give because giving is a gift. It's a gift for us. If God has blessed you with the ability to give someone, and I don't care if that's giving is your time, if that's your finances, if that's something that you own, if it's something, if it's your heart, if it's, give it. If God has blessed you with it, he gave it to you to give it. He didn't give it to you to hide it. Everything we've been given, we've been given to share. No one should ever walk away from a contact with a Christian feeling like they've been turned away. No. They, haven't, they shouldn't be turned away from physical need, they shouldn't be turned away from emotional need, they shouldn't be turned away from spiritual need. If any of those things happen, we're not doing our job. There's a thing called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, and it's something that when I was in the military we talked about, when I was in education training we talked, they talked about it, all those kind of things. People don't care what you know until they know that you care about it. <coughs> So you can go out and stand on a street corner and scream the word of God. No. They won't listen because they don't think you care about them. That's where people say, oh, Christians are judgmental. They're not hearing the love. They need to know the love first. And when they understand the love, then they'll listen. God has blessed us all. He has blessed us all. Or we wouldn't be here today. And we need to be that blessing too. If we want to truly emulate Christ, that's where it comes from. We look at the things Christ did, the way Christ gave. Jesus didn't have a house. He didn't have anything. And yet when he saw someone, he did something about it. When he saw someone in need, he fulfilled that need. Whether that need uh, changed that person, Spiritually is not addressed in the Bible. He fed the multitude, but it didn't say the multitude was converted and baptized right there on the spot. He just saw they were hungry. He dealt with that first. He saw people that were suffering in pain with disease, with, with demon possession, all those things. It never talks about all those people immediately coming to Christ when they were healed. But he healed them. He didn't ask for anything when he gave. He just gave. 
He didn't put a condition on giving. He gave. The next thing Paul talks about, or Peter talks about here is that we should use the gifts that God has given you. 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So, what gifts do you have? We've also we've talked about that in church before. You have the gifts of preaching. You might. Maybe you haven't used it, but that doesn't mean you won't have, you don't have it. Speak freely. Speak freely in love the words of God. You may have the gift of evangelizing. You may be able to see better than anyone else the opportunity to share the word of God and the hope of God with someone. You may be that person that has a gift of, a, of seeing someone's hopelessness, of seeing the hole that needs to be filled. If that's the case, don't walk past it. Do something about it. Speak. I'm reading right now in Exodus. As I'm reading through the Bible again. I'm reading in Exodus. And I remember, <clears throat> intellectually, I remember Moses saying to God, I'm, I'm not a speaker. As I read through Exodus, Moses said that a lot. He didn't say it once. He kept reminding God, well, I'm really, really good at this. And God said, don't worry about it. I'll speak through you. Well, I'm not really good at it. All right, I'll give you Aaron. And you will speak through Aaron because I'm going to talk to you. You're going to talk to Aaron and it's going to go. Well, I'm not sure. Go. Just go and do it. And I find myself sometimes like Moses saying, I don't know if this is the message I should be preaching, God. I'm not sure this is what I should say. And God says, go. Say it. You speak my words, and that's all you need. Maybe it's speaking kindness. Maybe that's what you need to be speaking. Maybe someone needs to hear a kind word from you. I was reminded of that this week at the school. Someone, I had a, a student who was falling behind because they just weren't doing any work. And the principal at the high school has got a, a policy. He started second semester here. He's got his feet on the ground now, he said. If you've got an F on Monday, Monday afternoon, you're after school. Not three Fs before you do something. No, one F. You're after school until you fix that. And I had a discussion with a young man. And I said, the principal's going to come talk to you. And there's a whole lot you haven't done. You know you haven't done it. Is there a reason? Well, I kind of ran out of time. I said, no, we had more than enough time in class. Everybody else in the class got their work done. You didn't do any. No. Well, no. <laughs> and he got to talk with the principal. And the next day, that work was done. All of it. That he could have done. He had five days to do it. Didn't get it done. One afternoon, he got it all done. <laughs> and I went to the principal and I said, you know, I just want to let you know. I got one case for sure what it worked. Because last night... This kid kicked it all out. He said, make sure you tell him that you're proud of him for getting it done. Because we told him he needed to get to work. We told him he was not doing it right. We said, it's an F. Your F stands for failing. You're failing. He said, now go tell him he did the right thing. I was reminded of that. Tell him you're proud of him for doing it. It doesn't matter if it was after the fact. It got done. Tell him you're proud of that. Sometimes we need to speak that kindness. We need to speak peace. In the midst of all the arguing and the screaming and the yelling and the disagreements, somebody needs to be speaking peace. Somebody somewhere needs to step up and say, wait a minute. Everybody take a deep breath. Why do you have to sit over here and say, I'm in this camp, so I only think this way, and I'm in this camp, and I only think this way, and I'm a Republican, and I'm a Democrat, I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal, I'm a... wait a minute. Somebody needs to step up and say, well, aren't we adults? Why are we fighting each other to no benefit? There is no gain. There is no gain if all we do is quarrel. Nobody has a solution. We only want to point fingers at problems. Maybe your speaking is just speaking in peace. 
But all of it should be the words of God, as it says there. We should be speaking the words of God. Do so as one who speaks the very words. Now also in this passage, outside of speaking, it talks about service. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides. That's a mouthful right there. Serve with the strength God provides. Now let me ask you this. How much strength will God give you? Have you ever found the bottom of that barrel? Have you ever served God to the point where you can't serve anymore? I never have. God always fills me back up. I can't give it enough, enough away that God can't refill it. So if we're supposed to serve with the strength God provides, God will provide the strength. We have a tendency to try and, and this is something I hear from students sometimes, pace ourselves. I'll give a little bit now. I don't want to give too much because I want to plan on giving a little tomorrow. So I, I'll, I'll stop here because i got to save a little for later. And then I'll give a little bit more and I'll just kind of let it trickle. Does anybody remember reading the gospel where Jesus let it trickle? Where did Jesus stop serving? When did he say, you know what? <clears throat> That's enough. Let's just take it. Turn him away. Shut the door. I don't really want to deal with that anymore. It's my day off. I don't, I, I don't work on Sundays. It's my day off or Saturdays. Jesus never said that. When he got down on his knees and he washed the feet of his disciples, that was an example. That was an example of something that we should understand. Is Our service needs to be something we do on our knees. Because we're not serving man, we're serving God. And do you think God is going to let you run out of energy or run out of strength in your service to him? If we are doing it for God, we have his power and his strength behind us. Um, I know God doesn't ever get tired. God's not going to run out of strength, and he's not going to let us run out of strength either. So it's time to feed the hungry and comfort the, the broken. Jesus did it. When there was times when he needed to go off and be with the Father, it never failed that when he came back, there was a crowd waiting for him. Every time he had alone time, there was somebody waiting for him again. And it could have been easy for, for Jesus to say, you know what, you ungrateful so-and-so, just go away. Give me a minute. Give me a minute to myself. He never said that. When people came to him that were, were, were not of the Jewish faith and said, just let me touch your, your clothes, I'll be healed. He said, wait a minute, I didn't come for, you know, that's not why I'm here. And she said, well, but you can heal me. And he said, you know, I'm not, not in the custom of feeding Samaritans, not in the custom of feeding Canaanites. I'm not, that's not why I'm here. And she said, but even the dogs get the scraps from the table. And he said, ah, well, there's faith. Be healed. He never turned someone away. He did not say no when it came to someone truly saying, I need you. And I think every single day when we walk out there into society, when we deal with other people, when we see things going on in our, in our world, in our country, in our lives, in our classrooms, in, in the cynics down there around a cup of coffee, we will see need. We will see that. What we do about it is what's important. And that's where our service becomes important, and it becomes even more important, as Peter says, as the time grows short, that service should increase, not decrease. The worst thing you, uh, you can do as a Christian is just sit, sit back and say, boy, isn't that sad, and do nothing. Because that's not the example Christ laid out for us. Unfortunately, it's something I see a lot, but it's not what Christ said. Unfortunately, there are times in my own life when I see myself doing that. And I'm, Whoa, wait a minute. That's not what Jesus did. Why do I think it's okay for me to just say, Phew, 
I wish somebody would do something about that. That's not what he said. Now the last thing Peter said in this passage. Okay, keep going. The last thing Peter said in this passage, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer, a thief, or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will become, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue doing good. He was talking to a people that were actually being persecuted. <laughs> Physically, financially, they were being persecuted for being Christians. And he said, don't be surprised by that. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, if you're actually acting for God, the one who did that the best, they killed. What should surprise us if we are Christians? What suffering, what resistance should surprise us? This world is not our home. This is not where we're from. This is not where we're going to end up. So why would we be surprised by friction? By the world resisting us? By the world condemning us? Well, why should we be surprised by that? All these things we said. To pray, to love, to speak, to serve. Don't be surprised if when you pray, you're persecuted for it. Don't be surprised if you pray and someone says you shouldn't be doing that in public. You shouldn't be praying. That's against the law. No, it's not. Even if it was, that shouldn't stop us from praying. If we love and you are rejected, should you be surprised by that? No. The world's not going to accept Christ's love. If it did, we wouldn't be in the fix we're in. So if you're loving and you get rejected, that's okay. You don't stop loving. You don't stop praying because somebody says it's wrong, you still pray. You don't stop loving because somebody rejects the love, you love them more. That's what Jesus did. If you are rebuffed when you speak, if you speak and you are told you need to be silent, think about what Peter said. When Peter was called in front of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they said, you need to keep your mouth shut about this Jesus guy, he said, wait a minute. Should I listen to you or should I listen to God? Because God's the one telling me to speak. And when it comes down to those two, I think I'm going to stay on God's side. We need to remember that if we're speaking the words of God, we are going to get rebuffed. We are going to get challenged. We are going to be attacked for it. If you look at what's going on in the world today and the way people are dealing with each other, the way they're acting, they don't need truth to accuse. You look at what happened at the, the Right to Life march, the stuff that happened with the, those <clears throat> kids from the Catholic school and how they were getting attacked and a little tiny piece got on the internet and everybody was condemning them. And then you look at the whole thing and you go, whoa. You see the whole picture is a whole nother ball. Game. They don't need to have truth to come after you for what you say. They don't need to be factual. And that doesn't matter. And God says, you know what? I don't care what other people say. I care what you say. And I care that you know what I say. If that happens, don't worry about it. They can condemn you for what you're saying. Let them. It's not their job in the end to judge. It's his. So the time's going to come when we're going to stand face to face with God and he's going to say, what did you say? No. Did you say what I told you to do? Or did you say what was popular? 
did you say what I think you should be saying, or did you say what the world would not confront you with? I'm not talking just political correctness here. I'm talking about jumping on the world's bandwagon because it's easier than standing in front of it when it's barreling down on you going to run you over. It's going to happen. Don't be surprised if it happens. Just keep, just keep speaking the truth. You speak the truth and love, God will take care of the rest. doesn't mean it's not going to be a challenge. doesn't mean it's not going to be something that will cause you suffering or pain. Nobody promised us a rose garden. And the last thing I, I'm here, okay. serve. Even if you're getting taken advantage of in doing that, keep serving. Because I'm not serving for the result. I'm not speaking for what happens from other people. I'm not loving because I want love in return. That's not the way Jesus did it. He didn't love everyone because his life depended upon them loving him. He loved them because it was necessary to love. He spoke because they needed to hear it. Whether they receive it or not, that was on them. But that doesn't mean you don't love them, you don't speak to them, and you don't serve them. There will be people that you will serve, and they will take advantage of you. Or it will feel like that. And we all have that. And it's, and it's natural. And it's real. That someone does something, and you go, boy, that was just a kick in the shorts, wasn't it? Helped that person out and it came back and it bit me. You know what? So what? How many times did Jesus heal someone and say, don't tell anybody about this, and they took off running to tell everybody? He didn't stop healing after that. How many times did, did Jesus get confronted by someone, getting in his face and saying, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that, and Jesus said, oh, really? He spoke the word of God. And they come back after him again, and he spoke the word of God again. Oh, no. I had this concept that came into my head, and I thought about this. As Jane was so happy to announce, I'm going to be 52 years old this week. She was very happy to bring that up, because she's always going to be younger than me. Which, I'll admit, I said the same thing to Troy last Wednesday, I'm always going to be younger than you. A couple months, a couple months. How long was Jesus in ministry on the earth? Three years. What did he accomplish in three years? Absolutely everything. So far, God's given me 52 years. Every day he gives me is a lot more than three years. So what am I doing with those days that he's given me? How am I using the time God has given me? He's given me a lot more time than he gave Jesus on this earth. Jesus could have been crucified at 65. He could have had 35 years of ministry, not three. But he had three, and it was sufficient. Every day that God gives us is, a, is another opportunity for us to serve him and to do something. Don't be surprised if, some, if there's re resistance. Don't be surprised about what how the world's going to fight us, because we know God wins in the end, so does Satan. All he can do is drag his heels as hard as he can and take as many people with him as he can. We listened to a Christian comedian this morning on the news, and he said, hell wasn't created for people. Hell was created for Satan and his, and his demons and the fallen angels. He, that was what hell was created for. But the time will come when someone's standing face to face, God's going to say, you're not mine, you're his. That's your father's house. You get to go. Heaven and hell. My father's house is heaven. And in that, that's where I should be keeping my mind. And that's where I should be going. And that's what I should look like. And that's what I should act like. And that's what I should speak like. And that's what I should give like. And that's what I should serve like. In the end, it all comes down to one thing that Jesus said. In John 15, Jesus said, very clearly, a new command I give you. Command. Not an option. Not a suggestion. Not a thought. A command. Love one another. And then he put a qualifier on it. 
as I have loved you, so you must love one another.